Let's begin the process of switching over to our next speaker, who is uh, a delight to introduce. It's Emily Bethel, who comes to us all the way from England. She's a senior lecturer in primate behavior in Liverpool John Morris University in England. She's um, done important field studies, including a study on chimpanzees in Uganda, and even more importantly, studies on cognitive bias in rhesus macaques in Cayo Santiago in Puerto Rico. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce her. She's going to talk to us about cogniz cognitive bias and the importance of understanding animal psychological well-being. Emily. Thank you. Um, I thought I was going to come here and make the case for the value of cognitive <clears throat> bias measures for understanding animal psychological well-being. I think I'm going to give an example of critical anthropomorphism, I hope. So, <laughs> and I'd just like to, before I start, acknowledge my funders, um, because there's not a lot of time to acknowledge all the people who contribute to these kind of research. So cognitive bias um, is, uh, describes the way in which affective state influences cognition. And it's studied largely in humans, so I'm going to start by giving you a bit of a scientific background from the human literature. That's the critical anthropomorphism. Then I'm going to give, illustrate a study um, which was published a couple of years ago um, on my research with rhesus macaques, hopefully illustrating that research. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about implications and applications in zoos. And please do come and talk to me over the couple of days, because uh, I surely won't have enough time to say what I'd like to say. Cognitive bias is an umbrella term. It describes biases in the way we interpret information about our expectation of future positive and negative events. Together, I'm going to call these two processes judgment biases. They describe the way that emotion influences attention for positive and negative stimuli, and also our recall of positive or negative information. This slide, there's a lot in this slide. I'm just putting it up for anybody who's vaguely familiar with um, cognitive biases. Uh, there's a broad, uh, a very, very extensive literature on the relationship between cognition, including attention, and emotion in humans. Anxious people, we know, to show a negative interpretive bias for ambiguous stimuli. So if we show uh, participants in a psychological study faces that are morphed for neutral um, and maybe threatening or negative facial expressions, anxious individuals will assess those faces as being more negative uh, than non-anxious controls would. Anxious people have a negative expectation of future events. So when we run something like a, flu a verbal fluency test, asking people to name as many possible future, behavior, uh, future events that they can, anxious people will name far more negative future events than non-anxious individuals. And anxious people have a negative attentional bias. When presented with two faces, one neutral and one uh, negative, fearful, aggressive, Anxious people will be faster to look at the, uh, the negative face here um, than the neutral face, and they'll be faster to do so and look for longer than non-anxious controls. They're also faster to find uh, a negative face in a crowd of faces. If you didn't find that one, you're obviously very happy. Individuals who are anxious and also suffering from depression additionally show reduced expectation of positive future events and increased recall of negative past events. Now, I could give a two-hour lecture on everything in that slide and beyond, but for the purposes of today's symposium, the value for animal welfare of everything that I covered there is that we can use cognitive biases to distinguish between different emotional states so depression and anxiety can be distinguished, for example, by the difference um, of expectation of future positive events, because depressed people have a decreased expectation of future positive events, whereas anxious people don't. If you're anxious, you fear negative things, but you can also expect positive things as well. Depressed people don't. They allow us to distinguish negative from positive effect, affect. So we also have um, uh, a more recently emerging literature on optimism biases. So people are looking not just at psychopathologies, anxiety and depression, but also the role of optimism and uh, cognitive biases in promoting well-being, psychological well-being. Um, and we could do the same uh, for other species, and I think play in reptiles may be one uh, very good example of how you might validate that this is play and associated with positive emotions. 
Um, it taps into the psychological component of emotion, and therefore the, 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 the well-being aspect for us, our psychological well-being, is all about these things that I'm talking about, our expectations, our fears, our anxieties, um, and our, our optimism for the future. These are the things that feed into what psychological well-being is. Um, and also they can be applied to predict and improve future welfare. That's not being done yet, but that's what my research is leading towards at the moment. So just to acknowledge the first people to um, conduct a study on cognitive bias as we know it in the, um, in, the, in the literature at the moment, 2004, when Mike Mendel's group at Bristol University published a paper in Nature demonstrating that stress can lead to a negative judgment bias in rats. I'm a primatologist, a field primatologist originally, but I've moved into animal welfare, and I was interested in whether this method developed with rats could be adapted for use with non-human primates. So I did a study at the Caribbean Primate Research Centre in Puerto Rico, looking at whether cognitive bias exists in macaques, and we demonstrated that it did, and I'm just going to quickly kind of um, bring that study to life uh, and hopefully give those of you who aren't familiar with this literature a bit of an idea of how you might go about designing these kinds of studies. So the manipulation of emotion that I used was to test the same monkeys after a health check compared to during a phase of enrichment and everything's counterbalanced fecal glucocorticoids that I don't have time to talk about now. Our aim was to test whether stressed monkeys, like stressed rats and anxious humans, interpret ambiguous abstract signals as being more negative. Do rhesus macaques show a negative interpretive bias when they've just been um, stressed by the vet? This is the apparatus. Very proud that I built this myself. Um, we've got a touchscreen computer monitor here, and then on the uh, we've got the daily food ration or part of delivered at the end of the session and pellets dispensed here on a trial-by-trial -trial basis to reward correct responses. During training, the monkey would see, say, a long line on the screen, and he would be rewarded for touching this screen with a pellet. So that was a go trial, and a no-go trial would be a short line like this, and the monkey would be um, punished for touching this one. He'd receive a burst of white noise, not very loud, and he'd have to wait 30 seconds till the next trial. So monkeys learned to touch the long line, and not touch the short line. Like I said, this is all counterbalanced. During testing, we then presented monkeys on any one trial with any one of three intermediate probes. So these are the ambiguous stimuli. And we recorded whether monkeys interpreted this line as indicating a positive outcome, in which case he would touch the line, or whether he interpreted it as indicating a negative outcome, in which case he would refrain from holding the line. Uh, touching the line, sorry. So we predicted, that's what we predicted, um, therefore following the health check, monkeys should touch the ambiguous probes less often. And this is what we found. In brief, we've got our no-go stimulus here and our go stimulus here, the long line, the short line, and proportion of lines that the monkey touched um, on a trial, and we have the enriched condition in open circles and the health, after the health check in the closed circles. The main point, they weren't responding on no-go, they were responding on go, and in the middle, we saw a reduction in responses to two of the probes uh, after the vet check compared to when they were enriched. And we interpret this as de demonstrating that whilst monkeys were continuing to perform on the go, no go task, there was a change in their responses to ambiguity and that that reflects a negative judgment bias induced by stress in these monkeys. Okay, so since then, there's been uh, a growth of studies, a, a, an explosion. Ten years since that first study, uh, people have been looking for cognitive biases in a number of lab species, uh, insects, oh, here we go, insects, uh, starlings, rats, mice. We've got a paper uh, in review at the moment looking at laboratory hamsters, pet dogs, um, and another field of growth has been the exploration of cognitive biases in farm animals, so in agriculture. And again, demonstrating these uh, judgment biases in these, uh, in these groups of animals. 
For exotics, however, and zoo species, uh, we have yet to really start exploring those. We've got um, my work on rhesus macaques, although they were lab macaques. Uh, there's a study on capuchin monkeys. There's one on bears, grizzly bears. Uh, but I really think now's the time for zoos and uh, for zoos to start looking at cognitive biases and also to extend the range of species. Reptiles are clearly missing from um, this list. Uh, there's also a number of issues with the design of these studies. So if you are interested, um, do please come and talk to me. I've got loads of time left. I went very quickly. Um, I have... Uh, uh, I have lots of thoughts about the way these studies are designed and the way they're conducted. And I think there are some, uh, some very definite problems. Uh, there's definitely these judgment bias effects are there, but I think people tend to jump on the bandwagon and there's a new term and everyone goes, oh, look, we've, we've searched for cognitive bias and we found it. Um, not one of these papers uses the same uh, statistical analyses. Uh, a lot of the statistics, including the ones I put up earlier, which I'm quite embarrassed about, but they're published now, so I have to go with them. Um, my statistics got better, by the way. Uh, we need to be more rigorous in the way we conduct these studies, and I think it's brilliant that the, the zoo world is interested in doing this kind of research because I think um, it's having these kinds of coordinated efforts and really planning from the beginning how to do this effectively um, means you could kind of very quickly do a lot of very good useful research over the next few years. So implications and applications in zoos. Well, those cognitive bias tests take training, they take a lot of time, a lot of input, um, and uh, they need a lot of controls included to make sure that you really are testing what it is that you think you're testing. What I'm working on at the moment is developing quicker tests. Uh, so I'm looking at attentional biases. Um, I don't have time to talk about those now, but in brief, I'm looking at attention towards biologically relevant stimuli I use simple tools, so this is some work I'm currently doing um, on Cayo Santiago in Puerto Rico with free-ranging macaques, and they will just sit there, you can go up to them, you can show them images, you can run these tests with free-ranging um, animals that are well habituated. Uh, so these kinds of tests are perfect for working, say, in a kind of captive social housing condition where your animals are well habituated. And I'm also working on a grant with the Medical Research Council and the NC3Rs, the National Centre for the Replacement, Refinement and Reduction of Animals in Research in the UK, on an exciting project developing eye-tracking technologies for use with laboratory macaques used in research. So there's some really kind of exciting new developments on their way. I triangulate these with physiological and genetic markers of stress. Um, as you've probably guessed, these can be applied not just to um, measure stress in animals at this moment in time, but they also have value for predicting and reducing, importantly, vulnerability to stress in the future. And I'd be really happy to talk to anybody, because um, that's the real value of these measures. Not as, as far as I'm concerned, it's not about measuring is this animal at this moment happy. Cognitive bias measures as they exist at the moment are a point of principle. Um, but what I'm really excited about is their value to be applied to predict the likely psychological response of animal to future stressors that they might not have ex um, experienced before to identify what might be a future stressor for that animal and therefore to take preventative action um, as well as reducing vulnerability to those future stressors by using certain kinds of training paradigms. And finally, just anecdotally, the veterinary and care staff at the Primate Breeding Centre in the UK, where I've been doing this research, have reported that the animals that they've been working with have really responded well to this, and certainly animals that have been passed on to research institutions have reported back very favourably on these animals. So although this is really early days for these future advances, we definitely have some very positive um, signals and information coming back. And just to finish, to um, acknowledge just some of the people that have um, contributed to this work along the way. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Emily. And there is time for questions.
And maybe I'll ask the first question, if you don't mind. Um, when you uh, introduced this topic, you talked about humans and individual difference in humans, but when you talked about the monkeys, they were the same monkeys under different conditions, correct? Were, were there personality differences in your monkeys? That's a really interesting question, because in, um, in my paper, I show that although there was an overall effect, what we found were um, a great deal of variation between the monkeys, after the health check. And I think what this, or in one of the conditions, I forget now, um, but there was a great deal of variation between the animals. And I'm now looking at possible genetic um, and early life effects um, and the role of other factors in determining these individual differences. But I would absolutely expect there to be, in a species like um, the rhesus macaque, there to be large individual differences. The point is, in the stress condition, they all responded the same way. So, yeah. Questions? Yeah, uh, yes, up in the... Uh, um, so, when you say that the animals in the are doing better after this cognitive bias research, what do you mean by better? Are we more tuned in to things that might be stressful for them and try to avoid them? Or, or what does better mean in that context? Well, there's several things. I don't know because I don't have direct contact with the facilities where they go to because um, it's very difficult to just chat about animals in these kinds of situations. It's often... Um, I, think, I think there's a general training effect. So the fact that these animals are just being worked with. Um, possibly a, a better example is the feedback from the care staff who feel by doing this work, they get a better feel for the psychology, the personality of individual animals. So an animal may appear to be shy because they're low ranking in the group, but actually when you get to work with that animal, you'll be surprised at how bold and how bold that animal is and exactly what they are interested in that you wouldn't necessarily get just from watching them in the social group. And, my, and this research is very much about working with animals in their social setting and causing minimal disruption to the social kind of setting of those animals. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? So um, uh, we actually, I, we, we're ahead of schedule suddenly, so we have time, so think, think of things. But let me, let me ask another one, which have you, um, you you've, have, can you give us any insights about how this might play out in zoos? It would be speculative on your part, but do you have in mind uh, like a zoo setting where cognitive bias might be steered more positively or negatively? I don't know. One of the things that we're looking at, I was hoping you would tell me, I'm not a zoo <laughs> researcher, um, but what we find is, for example, in uh, hugely stressful life events like transfer to a new facility, for example, um, using the kinds of training paradigms that I haven't talked about, but I think this could go towards, you could, for animals that are at high risk, um, engage some of these training paradigms uh, before transfer to maybe reduce stress response during the, the, the transfer process. Um, but really, it would be for the zoo community to <laughs> identify if this would be any useful to you. I'm I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent application. The, the uh, idea is if we have a medical exam, we're destined to having a bad day for the rest of the day or seeing the day more darkly. If there was a way to alleviate that in some way uh, to... Absolutely. Well, it will allow you to identify individuals that are affected and those that aren't, that might not be visible just from behavioral responses alone. As we know, a lot of a lot of kind of behavioral behaviors associated with stress are actually indicative of coping mechanisms. So um, the, this would get at animals that possibly are suffering mentally that you might not pick up on that um, from behavioral measures. But, uh, you know, the veterinary inspection, I think, is a really key point because when animals are ill, who goes in there? The vet. And what's the most stressful thing that can happen to an animal? In a lot of facilities, it's getting a visit from the vet. So when these animals are at their most vulnerable, we send in the biggest <laughs> stressor that they dread seeing. Gu guaranteeing a bad day. My, my physician always gives me a lollipop, so I, I, feel, I feel better at the end. <laughs> and anybody else? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Thank you. Uh, Emily.